this session we we'll like to discuss uh, different data collections available in typical functional programming uh, languages. So as we are aware, we'll use Scala to explain those data collections. Collections are usually containers where we can store different things. Usual functional programming languages has the collection types such as arrays, lists, tuples, options, maps, sets, and so on and so on. Uh, some of these collections may be strict or lazy. Usually, lazy collections have the elements that may not consume the memory until they you access. Some of the collections are mutable, some of them are immutable. So mutable things can change dynamically. Immutable data cannot change after it defines. So we will pick few collection types available in Scala and then we see how those collections work and there are few properties and so on. We will start the basic collection type available in any programming language that's arrays. As you know, arrays are collection of the same types. So, for example, if you want to store integers, set of integers in a program, so maybe we need to have, let's say, 10, 10 integers, so we have to have 10 variables that is inconvenient. So in order to, to store those 10 variables, so we can have one collection. If our variables are same type, the best collection is arrays. So we could have, we can define array where we can store all 10 in the same array. So it's a collection of elements. So usually arrays, numbers, indexes, array indexes start from zero in most of the programming languages. So the first element in the array collection is refers as zero element. And the last element is basically refers as if there are n, n numbers, there are n minus one, is the last element in there, if there are 100 elements, so the first one is zero, last one is 99. So arrays are kind of storage area where we can store same type of elements. So the numbers we use to access those arrays point as indexes. Indexes, as you know, start from zero and go, go to n minus one, if there are n elements in the array. So in Scala, how do you declare the array? So arrays can be declared as variables or values. So we say variable here, and the name of the array, then we give an equal sign, and then give a keyword array, and the bracket we should give the elements. So all should be same type. So if you give that, Scala will create an array called marks. Elements are the ones initially given. So those elements which we have given can be changed. Array collection is mutable. So after we define array, there are several predefined methods or functions available, pre-built functions available. So by calling those, we can do several operations to array. And there are some properties available array. By calling those uh, kind of attributes, we can get some properties of the array. So for example, if we define array called mass, then in all dot length, 
it returns the length of the array. We can call dot head, it returns the first element of the array. We can call dot tail, it returns the all the array except the first element. There is a one called dot first and dot last, like that. Like that. So we have several predefined methods. So if you want to kind of get an individual elements, we can give a name of the array within the bracket, we can give the index where we want to uh, retrieve. Similarly, if you want to assign something to the particular array or change the element of the array, we can give marks or whatever the name of the array, square bracket the index and equals nine and give the new value. In Scala, there are several predefined methods available in there, as I said. So those methods can be uh, can define as operators. They have defined those methods as operators, operators in Scala. So these are the kind of useful operators. Those operators, most of those operators are valid, not only for arrays, but also for other collections as well. So for example, call and plus tells to add one item like to the array. So there is an array, we put colon plus and the element. So that element will be added to the existing array as the last element. So if you want to add two arrays together, we can add, use two plus signs and then give two arrays together, it will create a new array. So that also created new array. So when you put class and colon here, so it adds the element to the front of the array. So when you put like plus plus and colon with the new array, plus plus colon and the old array, it prepaint n items uh, to the array. This is append uh, to the end. This is prepaint to the beginning, like that. So there are several operators. I will show you a demo in a separate lecture. So let's say we want to declare array and read some data to the array from the keyboard. So in case at the declaration time, we don't know the elements of that array. So this is how we should declare it. So we say variable, the name of the variable array and we say this is the integer type of the array then put the equal sign and using new keyword we can create a new array object so we say new array with five elements so in that way also we can declare if you want without declaring such arrays we can read some elements and return the array with set of elements so let's say we want to uh, create array with five elements or n elements, we can write a method to do so. So this is a sample method I have implemented to show you how to read some elements from the array. So I am defining a function called read array, read a, which take one input, that is how many elements I want to read. And after this array is called, it return a list of array with that number of elements. So inside that, what I do, you see here, I'm raising recursive function. Have a look carefully where I do, I check whether if that I, the number of elements I want to read is less than one, I read the empty array. Return the empty array. That's just array, empty array. In all other cases, what I do, I just ask the user to print enter. And then I read an array from the standard input. I read an element, sorry, not array, element from the terminal. Scala, IO, standard in, read input, read the element, and I put that within the array keyword that create an array with single element. So I add this array. and recall re the same methods. So here what happens, 
let's say I call this with number four. So it comes here at the initially this is false, it comes here and then print that. And then it can't print the element and then you see, I'm calling the same method with I minus one. That means I call the read A with number three. And then same thing happens, comes here, it call it back with the number two, then number one. So when it call number one, it comes back and call it with number zero. So it calls number zero, zero less than i is true, that will return with empty array. So in the last call we return the empty array. So then that empty array will add to the element which read in the previous call and then to the previous call and then to the previous call like that. I can read a sequence of elements. So you see this beauty of functional program. No for loops, no while loop, nothing. Just using functions, we do what we want. Right. Let's say well, we want to print that array. There are different ways to print it. There is a method called for uh, different methods to available that. So maybe you can use a for loop to do that as well. But writing a simple function, we can print that as well. So for example, I'm writing a, a method called print A to print array. So I pass the array to that and I'm not returning anything, that's why I put return type as any. And uh, this is my definition of the function body. What I do that here, I check whether this given array is not empty. If it is not empty, what I do, I print the head of this array and then I call the same method with the tail. Tell me the array except the first element. So then it called the tail. So similarly, so when it called the tail, so if the array is not empty, from the tail, the first element will be printed. And then from that tail, we'll call that with the elements except the head. Like that, we recall till that array gets empty. By doing that, I can print all elements of this given array. Similarly, if you want to add all elements in the array, obviously there is a method, direct method to do so. But let's say we want to write our own methods to add elements in the array. We can simply implement it using a recursive function. So you see, I define a method called add here, which take the integer as a, integer as input and return the addition of the elements in that particular array. What I do here, I, in the first condition of the definition of this function, what I do, I call the is empty method. If the array is empty, my addition is zero. All other cases, my addition is has head plus tail. So I add a head of the element to the tail. I call the same method add to get the addition of the tail. So I add to the head, it's actually final addition. This add method will call repeatedly call till the tail get empty. So in the case of the empty it return zero, from that it coming back, it will add each elements one by one, and finally it get the final addition. Right. Can you think about a method to get the maximum element available in the array? So that, so I use a function called max. So you see here, so I take an array to this particular function and I want to return maximum value out of that. So there what I do, I check whether this array length is one, that means only one element in array, or if only one element in this particular array, I return the head. So if there is only one, so that is the maximum value. So I return the head. All other cases, what I do, 
I take the maximum of the rest of the elements, assume that is temporary, and I check whether the head is greater than the temporary. If so, head should be the larger. Otherwise, the maximum elements in the tail is made the larger. So when you call that maxi tail, so it is repeated call or recursive call. It goes up, up and up until the array size get one. If the array size get one, it might return head. So after that, it will return him back. When it's coming back, automatically, this function will return maximum value available in the array. So that's how we can use a simple recursive function uh, to find a maximum in a given array. Similarly, if you want to find a recursive function to get the minimum available in the array, so we can do the same kind of implementation. Maybe you can try to do it yourself. Right. So not only integers, arrays can be used to store any other data types. So maybe strings. So this is a sample of string array which has three names in it. So we can define like that. So when you call length, it is zero, three. When it call name zero, it's the first element. Name one is the second element. Name two is the third element like that. We can access the each elements in this array. Similarly, we can reassign the values to the array. The arrays are mutable. So if we want to reassign some number, name to this particular array, which we taken, so we can give the index we want to put element number this is a second element and give we assign that name to that so then it change their values as shown here All right now let's see the now let's see the other connection type, that is list. In the Scala programming language, list is basically immutable. Immutable means after you create a list, we cannot change the values in the list. We can access them, but cannot change. And list are quite similar to arrays or the elements of the list also having the same type. The important difference are in the list are immutable, first thing, it cannot change by assigning the values again, like in array. Second, list, list represent a linked list, but array is kind of flat, but it is a linked list, data structure. How do you define the list actually using a list word, keyword? So in Scala, if you want to have store some, let's say, names of fruits, which we don't want to change later on, we can create a list out of that. So I'm creating a variable called fruit. It is a list of fruits, so a list, and give the names of those fruits. So then I will have a list, fruit list. So I can add elements to that list if you wish. So there I give the name, new element I want to add, and then put colon and give the old list name. So then mango will add it to the list. Then we have mango, orange, uh, pears. Similarly, we can access the elements in the list like that. So when you say check, put two, it return the second element in the list. So as in the arrays, list consists of several predefined methods. 
few of those important methods I have listed down here, but there are plenty of them. So, as in case of array, when you call head, it returns the first element on the list, tail will return the list except the first element. So, is empty will tell us whether that list is empty or not? If you want to concatenate two lists together, we have to use three colon signs. So similarly, plus plus will add that uh, kind of like uh, uh, add an element to the list, and then reverse will reverse the list, and tabular will create a tabular list, uh, and we can fill like that this tabular list, and there is a method called fill. We can fill initial items to the list like that. So you can play with, there are plenty of operations available with the list. So in our example, when you call fruit.head, it returns the first element. Fruit.tail will return the rest of the elements in the list, except the first element. Fruit last will return the last element. Reverse will reverse the list of the elements like that. We can call the operations available in this list. Other important uh, collection type available in Scala is set. Set collection can store set of elements kind of, uh, together. The difference between list and set is list can contains duplicates elements but set cannot. Set has only set of unique elements. As in the list, set also immutable. But there are methods if you want to have mutable list or mutable set we can create. But default definition of the set and the list is immutable. If you want to get mutable set, we have to specifically, specifically tell we need it using Scala collection mutable set. Otherwise, we get the immutable set. But arrays are mutable. But the list and the sets are immutable. So for example, so when you create a list like that, we get all the elements in the list, elements. So we, we, you might see that there might be a duplicate. But if you create a set like with the same same set of elements, we may only they may only store elements which is not going to duplicate. So instead of two sixes, you see it has only one six. Similarly, in the set, we can have different types of elements as well. So we can have strings and numbers also in the set. So like that. So what you should know is set up mutable. If you want to have mutable, you have to specifically call here before without calling set, we have to call scala.collection.mutable.set and then give the elements. So if you want to print all elements on the set or add the elements in the set if they all are integers. So we can write recursive methods for else. So the set, list, and arrays have a method called for each. Using for each method, you can access all elements in the collections. So in the set we call for each, every element, if you put i, i represent every element from this list starting from one. Transform operation called print ln i. So what I said here, for each element of i, take each element and print it. That's what it said. So I can use for each operator if you want to access each element one by one. So we don't need to write for loop for that. It's, we can use for each or we can write a recursive method. So similar to array and 
list, set also has same kind of operators like head, tail, SMT, and so on. Plus plus will add two sets together. And it has methods available. You don't need to write two methods to take minimum and maximum. It already have methods to get minimum, maximum values in the set. And there are plenty of methods. I will show you in, in the demo those methods. Right. Mm -hmm. the next important collection type in functional programming or any other programming languages are map. Map is the key pair values. So if you do web application development, you know, similar to JSON objects. In web application, we use some object called JSON object, it has key value pairs. So if you want to store them in a program, functional program, we usually use maps. Keys should be unique, as you may understood. We can have values to those keys. So using those key, we can get those values. Again, default type of map is immutable. But if you want, you can define mutable maps as well. So for example, let's say I want, I'm going to write a program where I saw hexadecimal code of different colors, for that I can use a color map. So I create a value called color, which is the type of map. So this is the way we define the elements in that map. So I say red, so this is my key, arrow, and then hexadecimal value of that color. Then I put another name, ash, and then color, and so on. So if I want to get uh, extra values of a particular color, I can pass the color name, it returns the value. So if I want to get all keys in a particular set I call keys, it returns a set of keys. Similarly, if I want to print all elements in this particular map, I can use dot colors keys for each method. In the Scala, there is a method called available called iteratable, iteratable, iteratable methods. These iteratable methods have for each defined. So we call for each and each key value, then we can do various operations. So we get each key value in the map twice, one by one. Then we can transform that using this arrow to some operations. So operation which we want to do here, we print the key value plus space plus the color value. So if we do so and call this method, we will get the values, color values, x values for each colors to the term. So that's how we can access those elements in the map. So in, an, in addition to that, there are very interesting methods available. So we will discuss in separate video. Few of some important methods of map operations, operators, actually method is there, operators we call. Operators available in the map are keys, values, SMT, Add operator which add two maps together and so on. The map contains can see whether it's the keys in the map or not or something like that. Right. Next important collection type available in Scala programming language are tuples. Or tuples, some people call it as tuples. In these tuples, or tuples, tuples, whatever, is a group of elements. We can group different types of elements together logically 
with some name so we can access them then together and pass them to some functions together like that. So how, how can you create a chapel or tuple like that? Yeah. So we say value t and give the bracket and give the elements we want to collect together. Connect together. So or else we can use like table three for three elements one and two for two elements one and so on. So how do we add access to each element individually? We have to give the name dot underscore the element number to the first element and the underscore two to the second, underscore three to the third and so on. So this is a syntax where we can define the table. So this example, there is a one called Suran which has three elements, Kasu, is mass, and some Boolean value called true. So then it's type is string int Boolean type. Three types of elements, we group them together. So similarly, we can have like that, two elements, simple. So they are similar to map. So in the map is collection of kind of tuples where we can say like that. Collection of tuples we can define as map. So it's same like that. How do you access the tuple? As I said, dot and underscore and give the elements we want to access. So my sample tuple, so when I say one, first element will return from the three, last element will return. Okay, so for example, let's say we want to create a student and his marks. So we could do like that. So we create a student for less one with this and student for less two with it. That. So then we have a student name and his marks like that stored in different variables. So if you want to read them from this keyboard, so we can define the method perhaps. So I have defined a method called get students, right? As you see, it may not take any inputs, but its output is a tuple. It has a string and integer as output. You see after caller, we usually put output, output is a tuple. So this is the body of this function, get student. The body what I do, I basically call read line methods to read the name of the student and read it method to read the marks of the student. So when I call the get student method here, it let me to enter the name and the marks and return it here. Similarly, I can call it again to read the name and the marks of the other student like that. So we then, we can group student name and mass as a one element. So if we want to write a function to get students mass and also rate them, we can add a more, one more element to the tip. So like name, mass and the grade. So obviously we read the mass from the keyboard and perhaps we have to implement a method grade to grade them and put it here. So we can do that. If you do that, we can have three element two. So in case we want to print that, so we can write another function to do so. Can you write a functions to do, create a tuple like that and print it? Here is my example. So here I create a method to get the names and the mass. So it, I asked to enter the name of the student and then I asked to enter the marks. After that, I pass the marks which read here to the function called grade, which will grade the student with the given mark. 
and then create a tuple with name, marks, and the grade. And it is a last line, so it, because of that, that returns from this get student function. So by calling this get student function, we can read the marks of the different student, and automatically that function will grade that mark and put the grade also into the tuple. So later on, if you want to print them on the terminal, we can implement a method called print record, which input type is tuple. So R is the type of the variable, input variable. So if it is a tuple type of variable, we have to put colon and the type no. So that's how we usually define an integer type or other type of variable. So if it is a tuple, we have to put R colon and within the bracket, we have to tell the three types in this particular tuple we're going to pass. So in this, my example, we are going to pass string, integer and string type of tuple. So then I print three elements using printf statements. So how do I access that? First element, dot underscore one, second element, dot underscore two, and the third element, dot underscore three. So like that, I am three elements and print them on the terminal. So similarly, we can read and access elements in the table. So in the functional programming, our collections are very important. So we have to store our data in these collections in order to access them. So most of the collections are immutable like set, list, set, uh, dictionaries, or what you call map. Some programming languages call it as dictionaries. So here we call it as map, and so on. And some types are mutable. So immutable types also can change to the mutable if required. And in a separate video, I will show you a demo of how to create those collection types and then how we simply use it. Later on in the next session, I will go into what we call lambda functions or high order functions. There, you might see these collections are heavily used. Okay, thank you.